I'm Chuck Reese, and I'm a co-founder and editor of The Bitter Southerner. And I can't resist, how many of y'all have read our publication ever? About half? Okay, the rest of you are behind. Please <laughs> catch up. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, what I wanted to talk about here, and we're going to start this conversation kind of talking about what we believe are sort of the three foundational pu pillars, the three legs of the stool that hold up magazine journalism. And I'm going to get to that in a minute, but what I first wanted to talk about is, you know, when I arrived here, okay, the, let's, let's betray our ages, gentlemen. Okay, you, Fraser, you graduated in 73, yeah. and you graduated in 79. I got here in 79. I got here like weeks after Mr. Oni left. And I immediately went to work on the Red and Black, like literally had a story assignment from the Red and Black before I went to my first class at this university because I'd actually worked for three years writing sports for the Ella J. Georgia Times Courier when I was in high school. And I knew this was what I wanted to do, so I went straight to the paper because I had a friend who was one year older than me from down in South Georgia who was already writing on the paper. And uh, he went on to become uh, the lead climate science reporter for the New York Times over the past 10 to 12 years, left a couple of years ago and has a book coming out about climate change next year named Justin Gillis. And so I came immediately to the paper and one thing I realized when I started meeting and talking to the people who were older than me, you know, juniors and seniors to my freshmen. Uh, and the names Steve Oney and Fraser Moore were often brought up. Uh, and I, I know this shocks them, and I, I shocked them a little while ago when I said this when I first got here to them, but their names were spoken with reverence among the staff at the Red and Black because it was like when they were here, we had, there was this brilliant magazine called Impression. And you're going to get to see a bit of that. Now, Impression was gone. When did it close? 77, I think. 77. So two years after that, Steve graduated, and I get, got here. But the legend of it was strong. It was like, you know, people in the journalism school, students in the journalism school, students who worked on the red and black talked about, you know, we would go through old issues of Impression because it, 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 it gave us examples of the kind of writing that quite a few of us aspired to, the ability to write longer pieces that went deep into a person's life or into a phenomenon or into a group of people or a community, all, you know, all the classic things that magazine journalism are about. But I want to uh, start this by going through, as I said, the three main uh, kind of pillars of what you need to be conscious of and thinking about if you want to do magazine journalism. Uh, I think one pillar it sets on, and, and we all agree on this, is the personal essay. And, uh, you know, the way I think of these as editor of The Bitter Southerner is that sometimes there are writers of, of great caliber who have personal experiences, either with someone, you know, that can become a story that that comes more from their heart than just a straight reported story. Like if you were, you know, like when, I mean, all magazine stories, if you write them well, part of them comes, at least part of it comes from your heart. That's what I think. People might argue with me about that, but I would still think they were wrong. Uh, but, you know, an example of that is this piece we published in The Bitter Southerner. 2016, and that is included in this book, which is volume three of the Bitter Southern Reader. Available for purchase on the 
we've got on our website. <laughs> we have. Uh, we've done these books uh, three years running now, collecting uh, our favorite stories of the second year, volume three of this book from 2016, and that includes Old Men and Young Bucks by Steve Oney. Uh, and the little tagline we wrote for it was, this is a story about basketball, Pat Conroy, and other bigger things. So uh, why don't you talk about that a little bit, about how you know that piece came about? And well, thanks, Chuck. I am, by profession, a long-form magazine journalist. I go out and research things that I'll spend three or four months doing reporting on before I write a word. This story is about two hours in my life, and there was no reporting at all, but they were a very profound two hours. And Pat Conroy, I don't know whether you know his novels, whether you know the movies made from his novels, uh, Pat Conroy was a force of nature and a great athlete. He'd been a starting point guard at the Citadel on their basketball team an all-state basketball player in South Carolina in his day before he became a novelist. And I was involved in a grudge match for money basketball tournament with Pat one fall night in 1980 and Pat's team won, my team lost. Pat's team were all older guys. Pat was about 10 years older than I am, and my team was all younger guys, and these older guys whipped the younger guys' tails. And it was a mortifying experience for me, and I remembered almost every single second of it because everyone there brought something to it. Uh, the most important people in Atlanta literature and journalism all attended this game. There was a great deal of buildup. And I've been thinking about it off and on in the 38 years since it happened. And then came the news that Pat was dying of pancreatic cancer. And Pat guarded me that night, and I had to write Pat a check at the end of the game because I lost. You had to write uh, whoever your opposition player was a check. And so I sent Pat an email saying, never forget that night, Pat. Uh, I wanted to send him something encouraging, and uh, those are the kind of things you do when you have a friend who is mortally ill, and Pat was not going to get well, but this was my gesture to him. Pat, you, you're tough, you're a born fighter, and so then Pat died, and um, I thought about that night, I thought about the email I had sent him, and I'd been reading The Bitter Southerner, and I just sent Chuck a note. I tracked down Chuck's email address. I said, would you be interested in this? And Chuck sent me back a very encouraging note saying yes. And then I wrote an outline and I emailed Chuck the outline. And I said, what do you think? Do you think it'll hold together like this? And Chuck said, I think it will. Go ahead and write it. And so I sat down and I did talk to a couple of other people who were at the game to get their impressions, to get their memories, because it was a really big deal, and on some level, the game was about life and death because it was in honor of someone else who was dying at that time, a man named Jim Townsend, who founded Atlanta Magazine and a very legendary guy in Georgia journalism. And I wrote the piece, and um, Chuck was thrilled with it, and I was very happy with it as well. The moral of the story is, what is a personal essay? This was about two hours in my life. Uh, a basketball game that was freighted with some significance and that I'd thought about ever since, but it wasn't until Pat's illness and death that it all kind of came together in my mind. And the thing that you all might take away from it is each of us has had experiences. By the time we're 10 years old, we've all had experiences that are profound, and we continue to have experiences that are profound, whether it's joyful or sad, whether it's a breakup or a makeup, whether it's uh, a spectacular day in your life, a difficult day in your life. And if you observe that experience carefully and put your heart into it and bring your emotion to it and also tell a story, that can be a very profound way of looking at the world. And it, it's a, as Chuck said, one of the foundational forms, art forms of magazine journalism. It's a way to bring yourself and your life into profile and relief. And 
you know, luckily for me, Chuck had started Bitter Southerner, and I found Chuck, and Chuck treated this piece so well, and I'm, it's actually reprinted in uh, Chuck's new book, and I'm, I'm just thrilled by it. And I hope that you all will think, you know, in your daily lives, in your um, experiences, what might you write about if someone was to assign you to write about something that was profound or meaningful to you? And how would you put it in a story form? And how would you convey that? It's a, it's a discipline on some level. It's a little like keeping a journal, but this would be a journal in which, which somebody else would read. It's not a journal just for yourself. You're trying to convey to others. You're trying to share with others the, the quality of that experience. So uh, again, I'm very proud of the piece, and I hope you'll buy Chuck's book uh, so you can read it uh, in print. <laughs> Could I just add a note as an audience member and a reader of the piece, but also I was there that night, and the piece really resonated for me because although I had a vested interest in having been there and I, it, it told me things I had seen and knew, and it was a very memorable night, uh, but more than that, it told me things I had no inkling of because, first of all, it was coming out of Steve's experience, who we were friends long before this night, but as I tagged along to watch, as had some of our other friends. But in reading it, I, it brought back this very memorable night for me, but it also filled in so much and made it so much more significant for me, which I think is really the beauty of it. If it had been redundant and it had just it re reported in very stark terms, they came together, they played, the old guys won, and the young guys were humiliated. Uh, that, that would have had no value, but Steve went so much deeper, goes so much deeper in the piece, and I think that might very well be a, something you would aspire to, I would aspire to in writing an essay as Steve well, is you. describing. So the personal essay. All right. Let's move on then. And I find myself already wanting to go off on a tangent based on what they were just talking about, but I'm going to save that because I want to make sure we get through the rest of this and continue to make sense to y'all. Uh, the second thing that, that makes magazines, great magazines, what they are. Uh, is just you know what we call today long form journalism when when we were your age no one talked about long form uh, we just called it m magazine writing <laughs> you know because really at the time a magazine was the only home for that kind of writing you know and so we want to look at a couple of stories here. One, one that, that Steve wrote uh, and, and one that another Georgia-based journalist who actually is teaching now uh, at Little Georgia College. This is a piece that we ran uh, by Pate McMichael, who, who is at Little Georgia College teaching now and a veteran Georgia journalist. And it's called The Last Casualty. Uh, one interesting personal note for me about this book is this book contains two of the longest stories that are Southern has ever published. Uh, one called Kosher Gumbo and, and then this one. And we actually broke this one up into two parts. Uh, and the story is essentially, let me just read you the deck that went with it. And the man I'm about to read about is the man pictured here. Andrew Howard Brannon, can y'all hear me okay? Andrew Howard Brannon was the first person to be executed in the United States in 2015. Years before, he had been a decorated Vietnam veteran, but one who came home to Georgia with deep post-traumatic stress disorder. Then one night in 1998, Brannon killed a deputy sheriff Peyton McMichael follows the life of Brandon from childhood to death row, where he spent 15 years waiting to become the last casualty of the Vietnam War. Uh, and that's what this story is about. And it goes on for about 50 pages of this book, actually. It's, it's a long piece. 
but it's a tremendously good piece. And I know y'all picked this one out to talk about, and I'm, I'm, I'm curious why you wanted to point at that one. I'm a big reader of magazine stories. I am a consumer of them. And this is one of the best magazine stories I've read in the last 10 years. And it's a tragedy. It's about what happens when a police officer is killed by a disturbed veteran. So there are two victims in this. And the first tragedy is the murder of the law enforcement officer. The second tragedy is the execution of this troubled young man. And the brilliance of the piece is that both of those crimes are real hot button issues. No one kills a cop and gets away with it. Uh, and the damage done to our veterans by serving in war, no one can forget that. And this crime or this series of tragedies brought together these two weather fronts and there was a storm and the legal system was incredibly insensitive to the damage that the killer had incurred uh, in Vietnam and he didn't get proper treatment, he didn't, uh, no one understood, uh, but by the same token, he had taken a life. He had taken a life in a horrible, hideous way. And the thing I love about this story is that there are no easy outs. Pate remains through the telling of the story so even-handed, and he's letting you see both perspectives. And so much of our journalism and conversation today is argumentative. Uh, there are hot-button issues. There is a lot of screaming and yelling, and uh, that is what passes for discourse in America today about difficult topics. This piece is so fair-minded, and it takes you finally to the realm of, of literature. This is a human tragedy. Uh, every part of it was sad, and Pate recognizes it in all of its shades of gray and all of its ambiguity. And it's also a page turner. Once it, I mean, it starts, it starts with the killing and suddenly you're into this and you're reading it like a mystery. You want to know what happens next. So quite apart from his even handedness, he's just done an incredible job as a storyteller. And um, I was absolutely blown away by it. So that's why I wanted Chuck to include it. And um, it's, it's just very, very good. It's worth it's worth the price of, of, of getting this book. We're going to sell you some books before this session's over. But um, it's just if it's a it's a difficult piece, especially in the climate of, of Georgia today, that a police officer is a law enforcement officer is gunned down, and this piece makes you understand the tragedy of that loss, but it also makes you understand the killer's tragedy. It really is incredibly written, and you know, uh, you know, one thing I'd like to point out too is that you know, both. Okay, until I got the email from Steve Oni about wanting to write the Pat Conroy piece, I had known of him and heard about him and read his work since 79, but I don't think we had, I mean, did we ever meet I before that? Met. Yeah. But we both knew Zell Miller, so we'd met. Yeah, pretty much. But, uh, you know, here's the thing is, you know, when I got his email, I was, you know, because I told you how much reverence we <laughs> gave to these folks, you know, and I got that email and I was like, oh my God, Steve only wants to write for us. You know, I spent my whole life trying to be like Steve Oni. Oh. Uh, and uh, we've never talked about the details of that. That would probably require hours and hours. But, uh, you know, it, it, and, and Pate was the same way. Pate is a, a veteran journalist. I mean, Pate did not really go off and do, you know, the, to a storied career for national magazines like Steve did or, or you know, on to, you know, a a regular nationally syndicated platform like AP, which Frazier did. Uh, but I knew he was a great journalist and he, he was like, I just have to tell this story. And, and that's one of the things that I think is gonna be in common among all these three pillars. 
is that the best stories for magazine writers come when somebody latches onto an idea that they f that they feel like they're the only one who can tell it right. Like when you care that much about a story, it's probably going to be a great story. Would you agree with that? Well, it means you're going to stick with it. Yeah. Because in the end, you write. To work this hard, you're never going to make enough money on the investment of time to write a piece of that ambition, but you're going to earn something that may be more valuable, um, which is some satisfaction. And so you bring a lot of yourself to your best work. Yeah. You don't phone it in. And speaking of bringing a lot of yourself to your best work, this is a piece that Steve did in what year for Los Angeles Magazine? Uh, this is 2009. Uh, how many of you all out there know who Charles Manson is? Yeah, that still hasn't gone away. Okay. <laughs> well, this is Charles Manson in 1969, shortly after his arrest for the Tate LaBianca murders. This is Charles Manson with a swastika carved into his head in 2009 as a prisoner in the California correctional system. And this is my oral history of the Manson case written for Los Angeles Magazine in 2009, the 40th anniversary of the case. And the piece, I think, is still relevant today. How many of you all have seen Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Quentin Tarantino's new movie? Well, that's a fictional uh, version of the Manson case uh, in which he takes great liberties with the facts, even though much of the film is very well directed. The Manson case is a signal event in American history. There are these things that happen, whether it's 9-11 or the 1929 stock market crash or the Manson case where the world is different the next day. And the world was different after the Manson killings. It's really when the 1960s ended that Charles Manson, this con man and psychopath, could transform a number of middle class men and women your age into killers and to send them into the homes of wealthy people in Los Angeles where they savagely murdered the occupants of these homes. And so the 40th anniversary of the killings are was approaching. I was then on staff at Los Angeles Magazine, and I went into the editor's office and I said, we really got to address this because all the participants are now in their 70s and they may well be dead. And almost everyone in this piece is in fact now dead 10 years later. So I went out to talk to all of them and uh, did 25 interviews, all taped, um, around 500 pages of tape transcript, which I transcribed tediously by myself with you know, my earphones clamped to my head, and then created folders and files and cut and pasted these interviews into a narrative, into a story. And much of the interviewing I did was with uh, Vince Bugliosi, who was the district attorney who convicted Charles Manson, one of the most brilliant uh, district attorneys in America. And, and he wrote a book about He wrote a book about the case called Helder Skelter. It's a definitive book. And just to show you what's at stake emotionally for something like this, I went into my editor's office, as I was telling you, and said, we've got to do it. It's the 40th anniversary. He said, all right, I, I think you're right. So I went home that night, reread part of Helder Skelter. I went into his office the next morning. I said, I ain't touching this. It's too upsetting. I'm not doing this. I, I don't want to have this in my life. And he just looked at me and smiled. And I realized, I'm doing this. It's too late to back out. I've already jumped off the cliff. You brought the idea up. So. Yeah, I, I was like, I couldn't pull out of this. And um, the story ran in Los Angeles Magazine. It's about 15,000 words long. It is 15,000 words long, which is a significantly lengthy magazine piece. And um, this piece you can still find online, and I would encourage you to read it in the daylight. And um, it, is a, it is a crime story, a horrific crime story, but a story that has all these larger implications about the end of the 60s, the end of the hippie generation, the end of peace, love, and understanding. Uh, the moral was that people could be just as predatory and just as vicious as 
ever in life. And the one last little payoff for this, we'll see how far it goes, but uh, a friend of mine, Leslie Chilcott, she was the producer of the Oscar-winning documentary, An Inconvenient Truth, about the environmental movement. Uh, she's coming out with a six-part documentary on Manson for the Epics cable channel in March, and I still have all my tapes, so she's, I gave her my tapes, and the, when you hear, when she's showing still photographs of the crime scene, and you hear one of the detectives talking about what he saw the morning he walked in and found this body laying next to that body, or what the blood was like, th those are all, you know, people talking to me, so the piece is going to have some afterlife in this other medium, and it it would have been worth it to me even without that, but the moral of this story is when you, I, this was five months of my life, this was five full-time, 60-hour a week uh, working on this, and it, the reward is a piece that I think lasts and will uh, continue to be read by anyone who's interested in the Manson case, and all the people I spoke to, they did indeed get old and died, so this was a chance to get this down on the record uh, where, where it's still there. Uh, Rebecca Burns, your teacher, has practiced this same form, a uh, tremendous piece in Atlanta Magazine about uh, Martin Luther King's funeral. I really was engaged in the notion by a woman named Pamela Collip, who's a writer at Texas Monthly Magazine, who did an oral history of the Texas Tower murders at the University of Texas. And she went and found uh, everyone who was involved in that and essentially stayed out of their way. And I felt for the Manson case, the Manson case means so much, and I didn't think I could add to the meaning. What I thought I could add to was the body of knowledge and to let people hear this in the voice of the participants while they were still on this planet. So I thought it was an effective way of dealing with the multiple points of view on this case, uh, that as a writer, I would, look, I'm a champion egotist of all egotists, and I always think that when I get an assignment, I'm getting it because I'm writing it and because it's me. But in this instance, I thought I had, the, the less you heard from me, the better this piece was going to be. So that's why. Yeah. Well, let's move on then to pillar number three, which is the last time you'll hear me use the word pillar <laughs> for the day. Uh, and that's criticism. And, uh, you know, criticism is an important part of magazine journalism. Uh, how many of you guys rely on reviews when you're trying to figure out what movie you want to watch or what record you want to listen to, that sort of thing? Just show a hand. Yeah, you know, more than half of you, right? And I'm sure you get most of them online, but I'm also sure that you develop sources you trust for reviews. You know, like, uh, like I remember realizing when I was in my 20s, like one of the most famed movie critics for The New Yorker was a woman named Pauline Kael. And did, did you know her, Frazier? No. Yeah, she was legendary. Uh, and I figured out in my 20s, you know, that if Pauline Kael liked a movie at all, I would love it uh, because she hated most movies <laughs> and said so. Uh, and that sort of criticism, which is really, you know, I mean, how many of you guys have ever heard of the old journalistic adage that, Journalism is history written as it's happening, you know? Uh, and really, the magazine, journal, magazine journalism in its truest sense is that turned up to 11, I think, you know, because you're really trying to get historical perspective and context into a piece that is in the now, right? And I think criticism plays a really vital role in that uh, because you're interpreting the artifacts of your culture as they come out, you know? And so 
I'm just going to turn it over to Fraser here and let you talk about criticism because you're you're looking at one of the the, the greatest TV critics here in America, in my book. So, so go. Well, uh, it. it I, I did, uh, was a TV critic for the Associated Press from the early 90s until a couple years ago when I finally decided 25 years was enough. Uh, and I still don't know exactly what a critic does or should do and what any given critic does is it spans a, a wide spectrum from getting very erudite and existential about something uh, to essentially saying, you know, it's thumbs up or thumbs down, go or don't go, and, and infinite points in between and, and assessing whatever it is they're critiquing. Uh, as with everything in life, what I saw as my duty as a critic uh, changed dramatically over 25 years, one reason being uh, in the early 90s there were not that many people who had the privilege of being a TV critic uh, for a wide audience. Now uh, everybody does it, you know, it's uh, there, uh, every website, every blogger, uh, and they, they have a platform and they will especially if they complement a given show, that show will give them prominence by using a full quote of what they said on an ad. And so it's, uh, uh, the opinions are rampant now uh, for television, movies, anything in, the, in popular culture. Um, but I, I, in trying to critique a show or a trend, uh, I, I wanted to stay away from describing what happened, which is one kind of review, is to essentially tell the, the reader what to expect, and obviously without saying too much, that, that never was that interesting to me to be writing a synopsis, essentially. Uh, also, as opposed to what Steve and, and Chuck, I think, have uh, been doing in, in their careers with longer form work. Uh, I was getting about 700 words to 800 words, uh, which, since I can be verbose, uh, always felt like a limitation. So I had to figure out some way to be to keep myself interested and to 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 um, come up with something interesting within what I felt was a fairly limited um, uh, vessel. Um, so what did I do? Uh, it, I think it's, it, again, it comes down to not just describing what you're, what you're, what you've seen, what you're talking about with a, with a series, but giving the reader something, some insight you, they may not even get once they've seen it without having read your piece. You, you're setting them up for some new information or some new look at what it is based on some ideas you had while you were watching it. Uh, that. So it, it, it made, I didn't feel like I was a, a stenographer, just a reporter telling what was in it. Um, and it's uh, try to get some sense of what the meaning is. Now, some may argue that this is not the most interesting, or the most useful, and um, there, I'm not sure what the ideal kind of reviews are. I, I, I know a lot of people love just to be told this is going to be great, you'll love it. Uh, and and I, I, I'm, I'm sort of a traditionalist enough not even to like the idea of the star system with one to four stars or even a thumbs up or thumbs down. I think it 
what I was writing, I wanted it to be more nuanced than just to say, here are some things to consider and anticipate and or not. So uh, I'm rambling here, but it it's the, the other thing I could say about TV criticism, which uh, has become even more the case within the world of streaming uh, television is um, so much of television is what you're reviewing is something in progress. And so uh, unlike, I think, any other art form, uh, when you're trying to review the pilot or one or two episodes of a new series, for instance, you don't have a real picture of what you're talking about because what you're talking about hasn't been done yet. It hasn't been finished. Nobody knows, including the producers and actors. And, and I always felt uh, it was that, that made it more challenging and it made it unknowable. It made it more interesting. But you, if you're a movie critic, you, you go to see the movie, you know what, what's there, and you can try to convey that to somebody. But uh, we've all seen the first episode of a series that looked great and the second episode was terrible and it went downhill from there. And conversely, um, uh, many good shows, many wonderful shows take a few episodes to find themselves and to review them on the basis of the first episodes doesn't do anybody any good because uh, it, it's, it's uh, shortchanging them before they've had a chance to prove themselves. And I always thought there was no way to employ this, uh, but I always thought it would really be a good idea to not review a TV series until about its third or fourth episode. Um, and there's a, I wish I could boil it down quickly, there's a wonderful joke in the industry about, uh, based on the, un, the, the fact that the they often throw everything into the pilot and make it wonderful. Uh, and then after that, it's, it, it, and the joke has something to do with a guy going to, it has a choice between going to heaven and hell when he dies. And the way heaven is depicted looks really boring, but hell looks like this ongoing party with bands and champagne flowing and, uh, just a, a, a paradise of, and so the guy chooses hell. He shows up in, in the down under, and it's it's dreary. The fires are burning. People are screaming, and he said, "Wait a minute, that's not what you showed me." And and they say, "Oh, that was the pilot." <laughs> so so that's what you're doing with in the a little bit in TV, uh, but it's. Um, I think the the bottom line is there is no license to be a critic, and everybody I think thinks they are one, and and many of them are quite good at it. Uh, so it's um, exactly it, it makes it harder to to pick perhaps than it ever was uh, who you as a audience member can choose to heed, and, but it gives you a lot of flexibility if you have the opportunity to be a critic, to find your own way, and to decide what's interesting to you to do, and how that can be of some use to your audience. Ms. Frazier? Uh, you know, a, a lot of what you said right there just made me think about how, you know, in my own life, as I have attached myself to the opinions of various critics of television, movies, music, restaurants, etc. You know, it, it, the thing that criticism does is it's an aid for every reader in the interpretation and understanding of what they've seen and how it sort of fits into the cultural context of the moment. Or what they might see. Or what they might see, yeah. 
And, you know, I think the, the two-story examples we, we, we've got here, this first one is a piece you wrote about how uh, the election of Donald Trump as president changed the way TV storytellers who were telling stories about politics and government had to look at, at their stories. Could you talk a little bit about this piece? Uh, this is a little more of a feature piece, but I, I like to feel that I was a critic in whatever I was writing and able to express some point of view. And uh, it was, this was a matter of talking to some of the producers of shows that, that dealt with politics and uh, how they could try to keep up with what was going on in real life and, uh, and just adjust to the new world they were producing shows for, um, but it's uh, one of the problems we, one of the, the issues I had at the Associated Press was, uh, which as I hope you know is a news and information source that provides content to outlets around the world and of, of all sorts of descriptions and political uh, bets and owners, uh, so it, it has to stay down the middle politically and does. And that, that carried over even to me as a TV critic. I couldn't necessarily bash Trump in talking about uh, how he was a, a problematic force in, in TV storytelling. So it was... Um, that that's the kind of thing we we do deal with. I was dealing with the real world uh, at times and and writing about the shows that reflected it, but it always had to stay in the context of what the the show was and not. I couldn't go off too far into what I thought about what the real world was. Yeah, especially when it was controversial aspects of it. Right, and this is a little bit different because it's looking backward in a way but this documentary did and you know in your piece does well, too. Well this was I, I never really got that much pleasure out of bashing shows and and I, for all my grandiose talk a while ago about nuance and uh, getting into the granular aspects of things. I, I, I really loved it when a, a show came along that just was absolutely exciting and I could be an advocate and just say, this really is going to knock you out. And this was one of those cases uh, because my, re my reaction to it when I had the chance to preview it was, I don't want to see this. I, I went through this when it happened, and I'm sick of it, and I know it all, and who wants to watch this regurgitated again? And I had a feeling that a lot of viewers might have that same reaction. Uh, and, and then I watched it, and it on about three or four different levels, uh, talking about race, talking about the crime, talking about Los Angeles in that period, talking about fame and celebrity and wealth and privilege, uh, it's it, it was it's one of the most spectacular pieces of television I'd ever seen, and I, I if you haven't dipped into this, it's it's absolutely riveting. Uh, so here I'm still talking about it, uh, and so that was this 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 would exemplify a case where I I, I love just putting out the word that you got to see this. Yeah. or you're missing something special. Right. Uh, well, right now, we're going to go backwards. Oh, yeah, Rebecca. <laughs> it starts at what time? At 12.05. We'll hold no grudges. Yes, Parker.
Thank you. Okay. Well, right now we're going to let Steve and Fraser take over to talk about the magazine they worked for that existed on this campus uh, before you were gleams in your parents' eyes, perhaps even before your parents were born. I don't know. But, uh, and it was called Impression. So I'm going to turn it over to you guys and. Push the push to go forward on the uh, right arrow. This right there? Yeah. So bear with me. And I'm going to ask you all to look forward and backward as we talk about the history of student magazines at the University of Georgia. And I see a great exodus. Uh, but this is a story that I think really has some relevance to all of your lives. It's not just greatest hits from another generation. It's about what student magazines, what the practice of student magazine journalism at this university can be for you. And you're going to look at some of what we did during our era, and you may be appalled. Um, you may like it. Uh, that's for you to decide. But I hope that you think, what if we had this sensibility here at the University of Georgia now? And what would you do with it? How could you use new technology to do it? Uh, we did it on the constraints of print journalism with magazines uh, being set on linotype and printed uh, with all the old technology. Uh, and that was both beautiful and a constraint. You don't have that constraint. So I'm just going to take you quickly through some of this history and again think about how you might treat it if you were doing it today and what sort of platform it would be for you. This is the inaugural issue of the Georgia Impression, a student magazine that existed here in Athens for a little more than 10 years. And this was long before I was the editor. This was in the 1960s. I came along in the 1970s. But there is an iconic image, uh, the arch, uh, and yet there's something slightly artistic about it. It's a time-lapsed photograph. I can see in my mind's eye the photographer standing out in the middle of the street with his camera on a tripod uh, taking that picture. And uh, they've used some sort of interesting blue wash for the uh, inking of the press. So they're telling you this is an iconographic image that we've all seen, but we're going to do a little different treatment of it. This is a magazine. This is, and a magazine is about point of view. A magazine is about putting something of yourself into it. If a newspaper article is just the facts, a magazine article and magazines themselves are facts plus. Facts plus attitude, facts plus sometimes more facts. Uh, more facts than you can get in a newspaper story. Facts plus point of view. You bring something of yourself to your work. That's the first issue. Here is the masthead of the first issue, Mr. Wayman, the editor. I don't know what happened to him. But he wrote something beautiful in the first issue that I thought I would read to you, the purpose of the magazine, to produce through inspiration, work, and study the sound attitude, skill, talent, and practice needed to increase the rank of Georgia's young writers. And those are mighty noble sentiments. and. Uh, and quite laudable, and I think there was some positive impact that grew from his early idealism. Um, and I think it's a trait and a skill worth carrying on. This is a spread from the first issue. It may not mean much to you, but it meant a lot to me when I saw it. There was a climactic gubernatorial campaign in Georgia in 1966. The candidates were Bo Calloway, pictured to the left, Lester Maddox, the winner, pictured to the right, and in his first statewide run for office, Jimmy Carter. The editors of the impression, in all their wisdom, uh, even though Maddox would win, they didn't interview Maddox, they didn't interview Jimmy Carter, they interviewed Howard Bo Calloway, and I think that was so visionary because this is the beginning of the world we live in. This is the beginning of red state Republican Georgia. This is the political reality that still obtains. And Bo Calloway led us into that world. And the editor of the Georgia Impression 
uh, said, we're going to interview Howard Bo Calloway and not the others. And I throw that out to you. If you have a glimmer uh, about someone who fascinates you, a politician, an entertainer, a cultural figure who you think hasn't quite arrived but means something to you, trust that instinct. Uh, maybe you can see around the corner occasionally. And that's one of the wonderful things about student magazines. You, can trust that instinct. Another great thing here in the inaugural issue, Paul Hemphill was the most famous writer in Georgia at that time. He was a daily columnist for the then independent afternoon paper, the Atlanta Journal. Paul was covering the Vietnam War for the journal at the time, and that's Paul in his combat fatigues, which all war reporters had to wear in 1966. And the editor of the Georgia Impression went and said, will you write this? Will you write this for us for free? And one of the great opportunities uh, you have as a college student is to ask people who you think might reject you, who you think might not be interested, will you do this? And you will be surprised by how many of them will give you a respectful hearing and quite possibly say yes. And Paul wrote this for the Georgia Impression. The reason it looks yellowed, it's not because the paper is old, uh, the editors to highlight it used a matte paper in the middle of the glossy magazine to showcase what they, I know, considered was a great coup to get the great Paul Hemphill to write for them. And because we're setting this in time and place and showing you how the world has changed, this is the way women were viewed on the University of Georgia campus in 1966. You have a little tasteful cheesecake, and um, it's uh, beautifully photographed, and I like the fact that they've done it uh, at the Iron Horse, which is a legendary piece of sculpture uh, now standing out in a field in Watkinsville, but was once on the quadrangle outside of Reed Hall until students in the early 1950s tried to burn it down because they didn't want modern art at the University of Georgia. Um, but. Um, all that was the tranquil 1960s. By the 1970s, when Frazier and I edited this magazine in consecutive years, things had really changed on campus. The counterculture had arrived, uh, the world was out of control, and Frazier and I tried to capture some of this in the pages of the student magazine. And here are three issues that Frazier and I edited in the early 1970s. The New South issue I edited, uh, the woman with the interesting breasts, that issue Frazier edited, and the Sex at Georgia issue on the right, I edited. And we're going to go through them very briefly. And again here, think about how controversies here on campus today might be handled in this venue, and how um, the venue of magazine journalism, and how you might address things that you can't get into the daily paper, but you can get into a magazine. And I'll launch off with this New South issue. This is one of the most inflammatory collection of images you could assemble. A uh, blood red Confederate battle flag and an interracial couple. Uh, the woman sort of a gussied up Blanche Dubois and the man a shaft or superfly. These were, you know, iconographic cartoon characters. And the reason it works as a cover is that and this is about magazine journals, is because it's a cartoon. You couldn't do this uh, with a photograph. It would be too explosive. But as a cartoon, you can put these images together. And implicit in it is the question, well, is the South really new? And this is important to talk about here at the Grady School of Journalism, because that term, the New South, was coined by Henry Grady in the 1880s at a speech in New York to the New England Society. And you may not hear the term much anymore, but when we were coming along, uh, it was quite frequently used. It was the New South. It was a better South. It was a more open-minded South. Implicit in that cover is the question, well, really? Is it? Is it? Um, I had the courage to put that cover out because I knew that I had a very strong issue that supported it and uh, that the journalism and the stories would support this. So this is a piece about the history of the Macon music business, Capricorn Records down in Macon. You may not believe it, but Capricorn Records and music in Macon was one of the most powerful forces in America in terms of the music business. And 
Ed Kimball, the writer on this piece, um, went down. First, he called Capricorn Records. We had no idea that they would even take his call. They took his call. He went, and everyone there welcomed him and gave him a couple of days in the belly of the beast at Capricorn Records. The moral of the story today is if you called Tyler Perry, you might not call him. You might be too intimidated. You might think, no way will he see me. Well, Ed Kimball called Capricorn Records, and this story, I think, stands up as one of the best accounts of what was happening in Capricorn Records and in the Georgia Southern music business of that era. Just because a University of Georgia student made a phone call, and the piece begins with Greg Allman, the lead singer of the Allman Brothers, touring Ed around Macon, and then uh, they open up the whole business to Ed, and Ed sees every single department, and he just ducks in and out of each department writing about it. Um, and I also want to add something else, just as a digression. This student magazine we put out, we had a tiny office at Memorial Hall. We did not have a telephone. We had a beat-up manual typewriter. We had a desk and two chairs. And putting out this magazine three times a year, the drill was like one of those cooking competition shows when they give the chefs a piece of meat. Uh, the oven doesn't work, but there are some sterno cans. And so you make a fire, and you make a meal. And making this magazine was an exercise of the imagination. We had a $1,000 stipend from the university for each issue. The rest of the money we had to raise by selling ads. And it was, could you take some imaginative people get in a room together and make something out of nothing. That was the exercise and the great benefit of it, uh, that we were forced to think on our feet and forced to think big. Um, moving along, this is a piece from that same New South issue about uh, two archetypes of Southern character, the good old boy and the good old girl. The imaginative breakthrough in the piece is that I had a woman, Sharon Thomason, write about men. I had a man write about women. And Sharon's piece uh, is got one of the great kick-ass leads about a girl um, giving the heave-ho to a boy who gets a little too in her face at a bar. And it's just beautifully written and smart. And uh, it's very balanced in that she says, you know, the problem with good old boys is, you know, they can fix a carburetor, but they need to learn some manners. And uh, it's just, it's a lovely piece of writing. Mike's piece about good old girls, a little more romantic, but uh, sometimes guys are more mushy than you might imagine. Um, and then finally, this is a piece I wrote uh, about probably the most virulent racist in the history of Georgia politics, J.B. Stoner. And 1974, the year this issue came out, uh, was a gubernatorial election. J.B. Stoner was in the Democratic Party. He got 10% of the votes. So that's quite a sizable um, number of votes. And I spent a day with J.B. Stoner and his friend, Dr. Edward Fields, in their office in Marietta, where they published a racist newspaper called The Thunderbolt. And uh, I didn't really quite realize what I'd gotten into when I spent this day with these guys. These were dangerous guys, and they were dangerous rhetorically. Uh, I'm convinced um, there were plenty of guns in the house, and uh, the more I learned about Georgia history and the more, as I grew up, you saw, especially Stoner, associated with bombings and crime. Um, but this was a I felt it was a great opportunity, and it's somehow still relevant today. The thrust of this piece is about immigration, and I lead into the piece with Emma Lazarus's famous poem from um, the Statue of Liberty, and as you get into the body of the piece, J.B. Stoner's big desire at that time was to ship all blacks and Jews out of the state of Georgia, and for reasons I never quite understood, he wanted to send the Jews to Madagascar and the blacks back to Africa, but this is a piece about immigration, and uh, it's a piece about fear of the other and trying to cast off the other, and there's sort of a continuing relevancy, or I'm sad to say, um, but we were trying to deal with stuff like this in the student magazine, to, to bring these bigger ideas to light, and um, you know, you can probably tell there were no computer graphics. Uh, this was a 
line drawing to which we you know, connected a photograph and um, that was the state of graphic arts at that time, or at least as we were able to practice it. So I'm going to turn this briefly over to Fraser, or do you want me to go through it, Fraser? you want to talk about this? Uh, why don't I see where we go next. Okay, I'll, I, let me just speak to this. Uh, I, I, Steve has, I think, made a strong argument for, for uh, courage and vision and some of the pieces he's just uh, brought to your attention. Uh, I, I cringe, as I'm sure many of you may, in looking at this now. Uh, but I, I have just the, the tiniest bit of pride as well. Uh, this was, as you can see, September issue. And I'm not entirely sure what I had in mind. This was my idea. Uh, and if you can't tell clearly, this is a woman who may or may not be clothed, but she has footballs for breasts. Uh, it was not meant, I am sure, to demean women. I think what I was trying to say was, at that time, in my opinion, uh, football dominated this campus beyond all reason. And that was supposed to be my, my biting comment uh, for the cover of this magazine. Uh, I'm certain the number of people who saw the magazine and got that message probably totaled zero. Uh, but and I will also add that, uh, for what it's worth, a, a woman on the staff did the, the painting, at least. Uh, but I'm, um, I think even things that don't necessarily work and certainly look kind of ridiculous and embarrassing a few decades later, uh, one can justify perhaps doing, especially in your college years, because it's not so bad to make mistakes and when they're well-intentioned. When, when I, I wanted to do something provocative for this cover, uh, I had some sort of ill-conceived uh, message to convey and uh, I, I, then nobody told me no. <laughs> Uh, so we went ahead with it. I'm reminded of the, the uh, uh, Spinal Tap movie, There's a Fine Line Between Clever and Stupid. Uh, I think I, I know where I ended up. Uh, but anyway, it, I think at least in, the, in terms of uh, attracting attention, uh, it m must have. And I, I don't regret being stupid and making a mistake, if this is what that was. Uh, I will also remind you, if you are doing these kind of things and being provocative, trying to do something a little off course, there can be prices to pay. Uh, the main one being, in this instance, we lost uh, our advertiser, the CNS Bank, which had uh, been advertising a full page they did not see fit to return to us after they saw this. So that was, that was a blow. Uh, and uh, so we, we, we paid a price. But um, I'm very happy that this resides primarily about five or six stories down in the vaults over in the, where, where they keep things like this uh, in the archives and, and you will be just a bare handful of people alive today who uh, have seen this and we will put it back in the vault and forget we've ever seen it. I think Fraser's being a little hard on Okay, himself, well, but, we, uh, we can agree to disagree. <laughs> but I, I will rush through some of the rest of these <laughs> issues uh, and images, but this is also from Fraser's uh, September 72 issue, a piece he wrote. The moral of this story is there's so many fascinating people coming through this university week after week, talking, performing, and make them the subject of your feature stories, whether in the red and black or as we did it here in a student magazine. The, from the same issue. Let me, uh, this is another case where I overshot the mark, or <laughs> actually no pun intended. 
Uh, this, had I seen fit to have a, a note of explanation, I think would have worked, but nobody could have possibly penetrated my mind and understood what I was trying to do here uh, without my having been explicit, which I wasn't. Uh, some of you may, re may remember uh, Noah of George Wallace, who was a racist, uh, populist turned racist governor of, of Alabama and quite a powerful figure who also ran for president at one point and did all too well. Um, and then running for president in the summer of 1972, he was shot in the parking lot of a, uh, a, a, a um, shopping center while campaigning and paralyzed from uh, the waist down, continued his political life, but uh, it was a horrible assassination attempt you wouldn't even wish on George Wallace. Um, as it happens, he had come to our campus on, in February of that year, just a few months earlier, and because I was a photographer and I thought he was an interesting chap, I went over and he, he was a, quite a dynamic figure when he, before he was shot and almost killed, uh, and he proceeded to preach uh, at this appearance, and uh, I was snapping away at, at him as, as he was in action. And after he was shot and paralyzed and almost killed, I just thought, well, what if, what if it had happened here instead of in, I believe, Maryland uh, four months later? And so I took out the pictures I'd shot and uh, my, photographed uh, and tried to construct a little pictorial of what it what the coverage of that shooting would have been in Athens, Georgia at the university had it happened. So that's to depict him getting shot and him dying and then here he is in his, uh, after he's dead. So uh, I, I really like this, but I, again, I, I suppose if, if you all see fit to uh, try something that may not be entirely clear that you try to make it clear so people can appreciate what you're trying to do. We, we were not terribly supervised, I think is the bottom <laughs> line here. So the, the, uh, it, it was the good, good part of doing the magazine was nobody paid any attention to us from the administration's point of view. We were kind of orphans and so we could do anything we wanted and the bad part was we could do anything we wanted. Uh, well, this so next issue back to you, Steve. proof positive <laughs> that uh, we did an issue that I edited all about sex at Georgia. And this is the very grainy cover, and I guess appropriately grainy, because uh, even though it was the heart of the sexual revolution, there was still something verboten about it. Uh, the uh, shot was taken at an apartment over on Baxter Street. Uh, the photographer was the editor of the Red and Black, uh, Bill Durrance, who was the first photographer ever to be the editor of the Red and Black, Bill, to show you that there can be life after taking a picture like this, is now a city councilman in Savannah, probably one of the most influential city councilmen in Savannah, represents the entire historic uh, district. Um, but this got people's attention, and in fact, it got the administration's attention and the administration of the University of Georgia tried to confiscate this issue. They sent people out uh, to take it away from distribution points. Uh, you might not be surprised. Uh, the magazines were all gone before the administration <laughs> got to it. So this magazine was well circulated and I, I think it was read. Uh, the, um, but all right, so it, it's a salacious, kind of grainy, black and white cover. Uh, but what did we do with it? And I think you will see in that cover and in what we did with it, our own timidity about it. We were not fully confident that we were doing the right thing. So everything about the magazine, the tight faces of this issue, far less imaginative than usual. But we tried to cover sex at Georgia as if, um, 
this was magazine journalism. And yes, there were some funny pieces. There was a piece, uh, kind of ridiculous piece, called Getting Late at Georgia. Uh, but there were other pieces that were real, real journalism. This piece would be just as controversial and as useful today as it was then. Holly Bernstein, who wrote it, did a very fair-minded job. It's not an endorsement. It's not a, uh, it's just an objective telling of if you are considering this decision, um, where can you get medical help, where can you get mental help, what sort of counseling you would want. And then probably the most controversial aspect of the piece is the little sidebar of the box, which lists uh, the abortion clinics in the state of Georgia at the time. There was no Google. There was no place you could get this information. This was uh, a very volatile and provocative thing to do, but I think it served a purpose. This is something that everyone on campus had some interest in, and some people might have actually needed it. Uh, in the same spirit, uh, we did a piece about venereal disease and where to go in the student health services to get help, how to talk about this thing that people were too ashamed to talk about. Uh, Finally, uh, the best piece in the issue uh, was written by a colleague of ours, a uh, close friend named Mitchell Shields. And this was about the old Paris Adult Theater, which was the major pornography theater in Athens when we were in school. And the district attorney of Clark County had brought a case against this theater for distributing and airing broad, um, showing pornography, and it went all the way to the United States Supreme Court. And Mitchell wrote a piece about the students who frequented the Paris Adult Theater, but also the legal battle that was going on at the Paris Adult Theater that was going to end up in the Supreme Court. And it's just a superb piece of magazine writing. It's well-researched. It's well-told. It uh, Mitchell, uh, quite improbably uh, in our day when the student body was different. Uh, Mitchell had gotten a 1600 on his SAT. He was the star student for the state of Georgia. He was brilliant beyond the rest of us. And he just did a magnificent job on this story. And the, this story could be written today. The medium is different, uh, but I'm sure there is pornography on this campus, uh, and uh, it was a, it's a very solid piece of journalism. So yes, it was an issue about sex at Georgia. Yes, it uh, offended some people, but on a level that I still think I'm right about this, it was very responsible. This was magazine journalism on a difficult subject in a much more repressed Athens, Georgia than I'm sure it is today. Uh, this was my co-editor at the time, Michelle Green. This is the Athens Observer. We got a little controversy after the uh, story came out, or the issue came out. That's me with my crazy long hair of 1975. Um, now, I'm going to blow through this. We couldn't be controversial in every issue. We had to put this thing out uh, three times a year. So these are a couple of issues that Fraser and I did, and I've labeled them as business as usual. The, one thing you might take away from this, we're a student body uh, magazine in a parochial town, Athens, Georgia, a landlocked town far away from the centers of culture. Fraser and I, each in our different way, realized we had a platform, although that word would never have been used, and we could put a national magazine out from Athens, Georgia. And Fraser has a piece here on Captain Kangaroo, who was the uh, host of America's most popular children's show at that time, morning children's show, uh, in an issue that he edited, and he wrote that piece. And more, I think more to the point was he had been, this little kid's show had been on uh, TV weekday mornings in the 50s when we were children. So by the time we were in college here, uh, th this phenomenon of nostalgia, which was the, the big thing uh, where we boomers wanted to look back on our halcyon childhoods, uh, and one of those ways was to look back at a, sh a show like Captain Kangaroo and think of, which was still on the air, but we had seen it in its earliest days. Uh, so I thought rightly or wrongly that that would be of some interest to students. So I took a hundred bucks or whatever we had to spend and went to New York and 
went to the show and talked to the our stars here. Uh, and I, you know, I think it, at the same time, it may have pleased some readers. Uh, we had at least one sorehead who thought that this being the years of the activism and the Vietnam War, what were we doing writing about Captain Kangaroo? And I suppose they had a point to make as well. Well, and this on the right, Reverend Ike, who uh, was from South Carolina, but was based in LA at the time. And it's about the beginning of the prosperity gospel. Uh, and, uh, you know, a world that was then a borning and is now very much part of our world. So we'll run through these images quickly. This is the Captain Kangaroo issue. There's the cover. There's the opening of Fraser's terrific piece about his visit with Captain Kangaroo. Um, this piece, uh, believe it or not, uh, university students took over the office of President Fred Davidson, and this is a piece written by Michelle Green about being on the inside of when students took over the president's office and wouldn't let him in. And uh, I love the uh, cover or the headline, the president will be awfully sorry that he missed you. Uh, and it's, I don't know what the status of student activism is today, but this was a pretty bold move that students would be moved to take over the president's office. And this also shows what you can do in magazine writing that you can't do in uh, journalism. Michelle was there covering it for the red and black, and she wrote some of the news stories for the red and black, but this is her inside account of what was going on, uh, what the students were saying to each other who had occupied his office. Um, it's another piece by Michelle Green about Frank Zappa coming to the university to perform at the Coliseum. It's a, it's just a vignette, it's a scene setter, hanging out backstage with Frank Zappa. And it's the kind of piece that I think is a great exercise and may or may not be done uh, as a matter of course. We tried to do it uh, whenever somebody interesting was in town. The piece that uh, Fraser wrote about Rod McEwen was somewhat similar. Uh, the Reverend Ike issue, uh, moving through it pretty quickly. Here's the story about Reverend Ike. Uh, and a great lesson, I was able to get both that cover and this inside illustration just by going over to the art school and saying, will you do this for me? I can't pay you a cent, but I will give you the best display possible and it's gonna be fantastic in your portfolio. And uh, I learned a very important truth about editing. A lot of it's about begging. And uh, the, um, and, uh, and a lot of it is about, you know, the humility of going to someone whose work you admire and say, I'd love you in my publication and I'm going to treat you right and I'm going to give you something that's going to be a value to you as you go out into the world. Uh, this is a piece Fraser wrote for me about Ort Carlton. I don't know how many of you know Ort's Oldies. This is a little record shop on Jackson Street. You could really say that Ort Carlton and Ort's Oldies invented the music business in uh, Georgia, or was, uh, still is, uh, a um, raconteur, an iconoclast. Uh, he not only sold records, but he had a historic knowledge of music and loved to talk about it. And uh, it was just a trip to be around this guy. Um, his dad was a professor over in one of the science departments. Uh, Throwing this up quickly, there was a oil embargo in 1974 and the economy had turned south and Michelle Green wrote a piece about the anxiety, it's really the anxiety that seniors feel, but uh, about the anxiety of going into the job market at a time of a down economy. John Talmadge had been an English professor here, he was distantly related to Senator Herman Talmadge. I went to his... Um, apartment one afternoon and said, you know, my generation were a little scared about this economy. You really lived through the depression. Would you write a piece about your experiences in uh, the Great Depression? And so we just put these two pieces together and you could do this today about impeachment or about any other issue that is a hot issue. Uh, getting somebody, I'm sure there's somebody here on campus who either knows a lot about or was involved in the Clinton impeachment or the Nixon impeachment. Uh, it's a way to handle a national issue to let a student write about it, uh, but also bring in a, a wiser, older head to write about it. Um, I love silliness. Uh, the old Georgian hotel, it's now been gussied up, but it was 
uh, a frightful place and had fallen on very bad times. And I dug into my budget and told the writer, just go see if you can spend a night there and write down what happened to you. It's a silly piece, but not everything should be serious. Um, this is a piece I'm really proud of. This is the beginning of um, a whole change in media in Athens. Pete McCommons, the guy on the lower right, he's now the editor of the flagpole. And this is about the creation of the Athens Observer. Um, and the woman, Meryl Nash, did just a lovely, lovely job. And it shows what you can do in magazine layout, too. It's just a simple full-page photograph and a simple headline. And Yet, I think it stands up. It's got a kind of classical construction. I'm proud of the way it works. Back to abortion. Uh, this writer, his girlfriend was having an abortion. She was at ease with it. She felt it was the right decision. He was greatly distressed by it. And he kept talking about it and talking about it. He felt he was doing something morally wrong, spiritually wrong. And he would tell me about it. Uh, we were friends, and I said, why don't you write about the male's point of view? Why don't, uh, this would go back to our discussion of the personal essay, why don't you see if you can put your feelings about all the qualms you have on paper? And I helped him outline uh, the story, and then he sat down and wrote this beautiful moving piece about his enormous agonizing and regrets about this. And uh, it's just a, it's a lovely piece of writing and uh, addressed a difficult issue in a new and imaginative way. And because we had to stay in business, and we'll end with something that's still here, this full page ad from River Mill just around the corner enabled us to have color on the cover, because uh, you had to have a color advertiser the way printing worked at that time. So um, there was celebration in our tiny office in <laughs> Memorial Hall when we sold this full page ad to River Mill. So I'm going to give it back to Chuck to talk a little about how each of us in the post-UGA incarnations of our life have put some of what we learned here to use. <laughs> okay. Uh, how much time do we have left? It's 1.30. It's, uh, Y'all are supposed to get out of here at 1.15, so we will have you out by 1.15, I promise. Uh, it's 12.30 or? It's 12.45 almost. Uh, 12.43. life after UGA, and, and, you know, these are things that uh, there's a couple of things here from the Bitter Southerner that I want to talk to you about, uh, and I guess this is the point where I probably should tell a little bit about what started the thing. I had, uh, I had a job right out of college with a magazine called Ad Week. Uh, it covers the advertising business. And my job was one of my, my beat for the longest portion of the five years I was there was to cover the magazine publishing industry. And so, you know, when Time Inc. or Condé Nast or any other big publishing company would start thinking about the introduction of a new magazine, I would always like get to see prototypes before, you know, they actually launched the magazine. And over the course of my time doing that, I, I saw uh, three or four things about the South, you know, magazines that would cover the South. Uh, and they always bothered the hell out of me, you know, because the people in them fit one of two stereotypes. One, W sort of looked like uh, the opening party scene of Gone with the Wind, but maybe updated clothing. Uh, the second looked like the Beverly Hillbillies, which is a show that you guys don't remember, but uh, Duck Dynasty would be a good 50 years later reference point for you. Uh, and third, I knew that the South was the most diverse region in the country, and no, neither of those stereotypes had people of color in them. And I felt like that the South needed some sort of magazine that would, that was at least bold enough to address the history of our region. 
uh, and the fact that the original sin of all of American society was propagated here, you know, because it, it, it was our unwillingness to look at that directly that left us with a lot of cultural problems. And I knew we were getting in the right direction when I got a phone call that brought me this piece. Uh, this was the first time a Pulitzer Prize winner ever pitched the Bitter Southerner a story. Uh, this story is by Cynthia Tucker, who for many years was the editorial page editor of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Uh, and she won the 2007, I believe, Pulitzer Prize for commentary while she was in that job. She grew up in Monroeville, Alabama, which is famous primarily because that was where Harper Lee, who wrote To Kill a Mockingbird, grew up. And uh, what she did, it was after the Equal Justice Initiative opened its memorial to the victims of lynching in America two or three years ago in Montgomery, Alabama. And, you know, she grew up in Monroeville, Monroe County, Alabama. And the EJI's project actually documents, you know, more than 4,000 lynchings across America and mostly in the South. And uh, what she wanted, to, she was amazed because she grew up, you know, black in Monroeville, you know, both her parents were, were black. And she was amazed when the EJI Memorial was opened that there had been 17 lynchings in her home county and that her parents had never told her about that part of the county's history, you know. And so what Cynthia did was she, she lives in Mobile, Alabama now, so she went home to Monroeville and began to interview the old people she grew up with and got her to got them to start telling those stories that they had always been afraid to tell before and it gave us a piece that was the real it gave people a real look at what at how a whole community dealt with the problem of racism and the problem of racial violence in the South. This next story was primarily a photo essay and it was called Black Cowboys Are Real. Uh, and, and the point it made was exactly what the headline says. <laughs> you know, people don't often think of the cowboy image, people who are involved in rodeo or cattle ranching as, you know, you picture a cowboy, you usually picture a white cowboy. That's not the case. And a lot of what the Bitter Southerner does is just do stories that say to pay people, hey, look, something that you don't believe is real or would, wouldn't believe is real simply because it's in the South. Hey, look at it. Here it is. Uh, this was a piece that uh, we ran. And this was written by a woman named Carly Berlin, who was among the first two interns that the Bitter Southerner ever had in 2015. Uh, and this was a piece she wrote for us that we published a few months ago called Two Houses on the Milledgeville Eatonton Road, on the Eatonton Milledgeville Road. Uh, okay, there are two famous women novelists who lived in Eaton, who grew up in Eatonton, one in Eatonton and one in Milledgeville. Can anybody name them? Milledgeville, that's right. Eatonton, Alice Walker in Eatonton. And this is a really great example of the kind of personal essay we were talking about before, because it's based on a road trip that Carly took with her mom out of Atlanta and down to Eatonton where they visited uh, the house that Alice Walker grew up in and Andalusia, which is the one you see here, which is a museum now. It was Flannery O'Connor's home for the last 15 plus years of her life, I believe. Uh, and it, it was just about 
the the thing we put on it was when you decide to reckon with the spirit of de with the spirit of the dead, in particular that of Flannery O'Connor, you must also reckon with the spirit of one ver still very much alive, Alice Walker, a road trip meditation on two of our greatest authors. And it was just a story written from a woman's perspective about these two great women writers and the contrast between their lives when they were growing up very close to each other and how that later became reflected in the things they wrote. And it, it was just a really beautiful piece. And Carly is in New Orleans now. And in this one, I'm going to bring Fraser and Steve up uh, to talk about some of what they've been doing in their life after UGA. <laughs> Let me swallow. Um, well, I was a, a big fan of the show, uh, which fascinated me because it was so smart and also, of course, so at times tasteless and even disgusting. And so just dealing with those polarities uh, and finding it funny, uh, even as I was at times appalled at myself, made, made me all the more interested in the show. So, and I, I continue to think it's absolutely brilliant. <clears throat> so uh, I had the chance to, to write the text for this 20th anniversary uh, sort of souvenir book uh, with photos and graphics and available on Amazon. Uh, but that's when I left the AP, uh, sort of retired from the AP at, at least at, in, uh, about two years ago. Um, one thing that sort of hastened my decision was they wanted to get this book out. So uh, on a sort of crash schedule, we, we did that. And, and this is what resulted. It was uh, pub published, <coughs> excuse me, um, this past uh, April. And uh, it's, a, it's a pretty fun book. Uh, it gave me the chance to play, play critic and kind of uh, uh, really penetrating what it was about the show that, that interested me and also uh, I could be somewhat of a reporter by talking to many of the people responsible for the show and explaining how you do a show like this which is infinitely more complicated than I think almost anybody can understand and involves hundreds of people and a year of work just to get an episode out. So uh, it was that was really fun to do and, and certainly eye-opening because I had relatively little knowledge of how animation was done. So that's uh, that's mine. And then we got this right here. <clears throat> uh, well, I've made my living mostly as a magazine writer, and this is a piece I did for Playboy. Does anyone recognize who this is? Well, the man. Well, the woman we'll get to, too. She's of note. Uh, this is Herschel Walker, the great Heisman Trophy winner at the University of Georgia. And Herschel, uh, on his 50th birthday, decided to do something that some would think is insane and uh, that he saw as a challenge. He became a mixed martial arts fighter and decided to start fighting guys in their early 20s and felt that in his 50s, he was a superb enough athlete to hold his own. And, you know, Herschel Walker, if you know of him, you probably know of him as a Heisman Trophy winner here, but he has done many amazing things in his life. Uh, he danced with the Fort Worth Ballet. He was on the United States Olympics team in two-man bobsled, uh, finished seventh. He wasn't a medalist, but mighty good for somebody who had never been on a bobsled until he decided he was going to do it. And he also suffers from mental illness, about which he's quite upfront. And this is a piece about the demons that drive Herschel Walker. And 
One of the joys of doing magazine journalism on this level is Herschel now lives in Dallas. I went to Dallas to spend several days with him, talking to him, hanging out. Uh, I got back to where I now live in Los Angeles and told my editor I had a fantastic time with Herschel Walker, but I don't think this is a piece yet, even though I had an assignment. And he said, well, what else do you need? I said, I need to be with him at his gym and the gym where he trains for mixed martial arts fighting. And Herschel's got a full-time job uh, running a chicken. Uh, he provides chicken to McDonald's and uh, maybe to Chick-fil-A for all I know, but it's a pretty substantial operation. But he hangs out a uh, few weeks every year at the American Kickboxing Academy in San Jose, California, which is a premier center to learn how to be a mixed martial, not to learn, you're already great if you get there, but. So I waited three months. Uh, he was going to spend a couple weeks at the gym. He invited me to come spend that time with him. So I had the lead for my story. And because it was a magazine piece and because the magazine had the, uh, I've written a lot for Playboy and the editor trusted me. And he was willing to give me the time to, to wait until I got the lead for the story. So the story begins with uh, Herschel at the American Kickboxing Academy, and it ends with uh, the stuff that I got when I was researching it in Dallas. And Herschel, uh, he was, is a fascinating guy, very, very open, alarmingly open in some ways. Uh, I write very honestly about his mental illness in the piece, and when I was working on it, uh, he did something that most subjects of a profile would never do. He gave me the name and number of his psychologist and said, Colin, he will tell you about what it is I'm dealing with. So Herschel, uh, you start reading this piece and suddenly his psychologist is talking about his mental issues and that's a degree of intimacy that you almost never get as a writer. And uh, the, but part of it, Herschel and I, I felt established a pretty quick rapport. We liked each other. Uh, but part of it is he, he's a very honest person and believes that uh, you shouldn't hide your battles with your sanity. You shouldn't hide your battles in life. And um, so I think it's a delightful piece about Herschel, and I love the opening spread. There he is at age 50. Uh, you know, still does his 2,000 push-ups a day and uh, is a pretty fit specimen. The cover, just of note, uh, that is Leanne Tweeden. Does anyone know who Leanne Tweeden is? Uh, you, you know? I don't. Well, she appears in the altogether in an uh, eight-page spread in this same issue. She is a woman who either... Uh, brought down or brought to justice Al Franken, depending on your point of view. Uh, she's the oh, woman okay. on the plane that Al Franken uh, grabbed while she was supposedly sleeping. But this okay. is Le Leanne Tweeden. Just a strange proximity. All right, here's another one of yours. Yeah, this is a piece I wrote for Time Magazine. Uh, this is Andrew Breitbart the uh, founder of probably the most volatile right-wing website in America, a man who in many ways was responsible for the election of Donald Trump after Andrew <coughs> died an untimely death. Uh, Steve Bannon became the chairman of Breitbart Communications and then leapt into the Trump campaign. But this is a piece uh, that I wrote right as Andrew Breitbart was starting to take hold. and. I had known Andrew to some degree um, socially in LA and I had started to watch what he was doing and I realized while I might not have liked what he was doing that he was really on to something and I knew that Andrew was going to be big and I knew that Breitbart was going to be big and several other people did too. The New Yorker had a major profile of Andrew the same week that my piece in Time came out. but. Andrew was so delightfully shameless that when Time Magazine sent the photographer to do this piece, Andrew said, well, sure, I'll get in a bubble bath with a glass of champagne and pose for your opening uh, photo. But this is a piece about how um, the alt-right invented itself on social media. And 
It's a surprising piece in that Andrew learned how to do much of what Breitbart does from his good friend, Ariana Huffington. Andrew started the Huffington Post uh, when Ariana, who had been a conservative in an earlier incarnation of her life and a best buddy of Newt Gingrich, uh, she and uh, Andrew were pals, and she had hired Andrew to be a researcher for her, and Andrew and Ariana parted ways ideologically eventually, but Andrew looked at what the Huffington Post was. He saw it as a virtual salon. That would have, was his phrase for the left. And he said, I'm going to create a virtual salon for the right. And this is a piece written very early in Andrew's <coughs> success. And uh, Andrew, unbeknownst to anyone, had a heart condition and was dead uh, two years after this piece appeared. So. But I think it really, it, it captures Andrew at, um, as he's cresting. And I'm, if any of y'all are free tomorrow evening, I'm doing an event at the uh, Russell Library with Rebecca Burns about a collection of my magazine articles that have come out. That's the collection, uh, the cover. The University of Georgia Press published it in paperback. And my profiles of both Andrew Breitbart and Herschel Walker are in the book. And uh, along with some other notable <coughs> Georgians uh, and just some notable people. Well, that leaves us with about 13 minutes left, and I'm sure any of us would be happy to answer <coughs> any questions that you guys got. Yeah, yeah. in the back. Did you get this on Joe's library? Is this where we all started? Can you say your name to me? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm Steve Oney. I'm a magazine writer. I went to the University of Georgia, but I live in Los Angeles now. I'm Fraser Moore. Uh, I went to the University of Georgia. Steve and I were also uh, good friends in school here, uh, even apartment mates. Uh, and I uh, am now in New York, and I just recently completed 25 years as a TV critic for the Associated Press. And I'm Chuck Reese. I'm the editor of The Bitter Southerner. So. I'm going to jump in before you ask a question because I think, Steve, you mentioned how much impressions, pieces, people, faculty, people have come to this campus. You all are quite an example of that sort of attention. Well, thank you. Hi, well, uh, you're, you're what's our who name? the heck are these people and why are they? <laughs> yes. So I was just wondering how often you guys like come up with a story idea or something and start researching the stuff and then you're in New York and it's just not working out the way that you want it to and you have to like stop right away and move on to something else. Or if you guys just like continue to follow through with ideas and then sort of try to get it done. Well. I can speak to it from an editor's point of view. I think it happens a lot. It happens a lot with, you know, uh, for our two, you know, the, the Bitter Southerner is, is sort of a weekly magazine that's not on paper and only has three stories per issue. Uh, one of them is a, a, a reader essay, one of them is an opinion or critical kind of piece, and one of them is a long-form journalism piece. Uh, and, uh, you know, for those Tuesday sort of cover story feature pieces, uh, you know, it, it often happens that someone will come to us with a great idea for a story and we will buy that idea from them and send them a contract and put them to work. And then I get a phone call maybe a month later where it's like, okay, I went out and did some reporting. And some of the things I assumed are wrong. And I found out some things that I didn't know. And, you know, as an editor, what I try to do is work with the writer to go, okay, let's not assume that the new development negates the possibility for story. You know, you're just trying to look for the point that you can make with the available information, you know? 
everything that we try to do, and I think this is common to a lot of magazine journalists, everything that we do at The Bitter Southerner is the ultimate aim of it is to give people, well, the, the easiest way to say it is we want to complicate your understanding of the American South. We, you know, we want to make sure you know information that gets you beyond the stereotypes and beyond, you know, the the cultural tropes about this region. Uh, and so if, what I do is I kind of hold it up against the purpose of our publication. Like if somebody stumbles along the way with a piece, my job as editor is to help them work it out and I'm only going to kill a piece if I feel like there's no way we can make it speak to the point of the magazine. So from the editor's point of view, I think that's mostly about how do you make a, a story work within the context of your own publication? Now, from a, somebody who's writing for a lot of different publications, that can be a different experience, I guess, depending on the publication. I mean, you just described one, Steve, where you went back to your editor at Playboy and said, I don't have enough stuff yet to deliver this story. But, you know, to her broader question about what you do when you discover that what you thought was there isn't. You know, I rarely... quit a story. And in part, uh, it's because I typically don't get paid until it's finished and published. Uh, so there's an economic incentive. In part, uh, this is insane and maybe won't even translate to y'all since you were younger, but when I worked, when I started out in journalism, I worked for the Atlanta Journal and Constitution Magazine, if you can believe it. They had a Sunday magazine with a circulation of around 600,000, and it was really a tour de force. And it's important historically. Um, Margaret Mitchell, the author of Gone with the Wind, had worked there as a staff writer in the 1920s. Her desk, she was only four foot 11 or so, and she had a tiny little desk, and it was out in the lobby of the building. And uh, the magazine had different sections that went to press at different times, and the color sections went to press seven or eight days before the black and white sections. So the color sections always were finished early. And if I had a story opening on a color spread, I would sometimes have to write the first five paragraphs of the story. They would ship it to the printer, and then I would have to finish the story. And it was an insane, I always thought, what if I got hit by a Marta bus? Uh, uh, and Yet I would sometimes find myself having to finish a story because if I didn't finish it, there was going to be blank pages in the paper, in the magazine. And so I got this kind of teeth-gritting quality where I would finish something no matter what. And I might not always have liked what I, what I did, but uh, I would always finish the assignment. And yeah, I've had a few... Yeah, there are stories you make that you think, oh, this is going to be a really great story. Uh, like, I've always wanted to do a story on Trader Joe's, the company. They are highly secretive. They are fanatically secretive as an organization. Uh, so it was on my wish list for a while, and I didn't really pursue it. I, well, I called the publicist, but I realized uh, it wasn't going to happen. Uh, and I have book ideas all the time that I make a few phone calls, and... I realize the impediments are so great that I'm never going to get around them. The, I once did a piece for Life magazine, remembered by no one anymore, but it was the great weekly picture magazine owned by Time Life. And in the um, 1980s, when I was doing this piece, it had become a monthly picture magazine and it would soon cease to exist. But they assigned me to do a piece on the 50th anniversary of the novel Gone with the Wind. And I worked on it and I worked on it and it just wasn't coming together and um, they didn't like what I turned in and they rejected it. And But even then I didn't quit. The problem with the piece was it had too many elements. There was a section of the piece that was about how the South dealt with the conflicting impressions of Gone with the Wind uh, in the modern age. There was a piece about, uh, there was another section about the efforts to make a sequel to Gone with the Wind, uh, to write a sequel novel and then to make a sequel movie, and then there were parts of the piece that were 
just about the living uh, former or the living stars have gone with the wind. I had an amazing interview with Olivia de Havilland at the Beverly Hills Hotel, which I will never forget. Uh, so when the piece fell apart at Life magazine, I took all those sections of it, which each one of which should have been a magazine piece in itself, and that's what I did. I sold uh, the part about making a sequel to the movie Gone with the Wind to American Film Magazine. I sold uh, the part about Olivia de Havilland to Atlanta Magazine. I sold the part about the conflicted cultural legacy of Gone with the Wind to a short-lived monthly magazine called Southern, which I'm sure you remember. It then became South Point when John Huey ran it, but it was out of Little Rock, Arkansas. So even then, I thought I got to complete the drill in part because I'm stubborn and in part because most publications don't pay you until the story is is printed. And it's it's kind of a, it, I wouldn't recommend it as a business, but it is a business. You want to get a check. And, uh, well, if I could uh, just quickly explain sort of the, the, the counterpoint to my experience and what I, what I was doing, which was vastly different than what Steve does. Uh, I was writing pieces in the seven or eight hundred word uh, realm, and uh, the 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 time I was afforded was in the neighbor you know neighbor of hours or days, not weeks or months, which uh, for somebody who likes instant gratification that had its advantages. I got. I got in and out of things very quickly and got my my piece. And um, many of the pieces I did would be uh, spurred by the opportunity to talk to somebody involved with a television project, uh, whether famous or non, uh, maybe somebody behind the scenes. And uh, I had this, I involved this kind of uh, uh, standard that it, once I had brought what I knew about them and a show, the show they were uh, part of, to the piece I was writing, uh, I could construct a pretty good piece as long as they gave me something. I just I needed I needed at least one clever remark, some some observation, some gesture, anything, and. And I would al always insist on getting an hour or so with them, which was uh, more than many reporters might get with somebody famous. But we needed to at least have that kind of engagement and relationship and be able to have a conversation, which was what I tried to do with an interview. And so we would talk, and I, I, I didn't fool myself into thinking they were laying themselves bare for me, but within an hour, most human beings will give, give up something <laughs> new and fresh and want to, uh, which was the thing about many of these people. They had been asked the same questions uh, 10,000 times, so they were so bored doing them. And I, I was not practicing gotcha journalism. I was trying to have a conversation with them ease them up, even seduce them into relaxing and giving me, giving up something. Uh, it's something interesting. Uh, and, and I did thousands of these, so it, it generally worked very nicely, and, and when you could get them on a, t talking about craft uh, or, you know, technique, and this, I think, is a good lesson for us whenever we're talking to anybody and asking questions, as you're doing now, and you hear me jabbering on. Uh, people love to talk about what they do and, and to see that you have an interest in it. So once, you know, once I wasn't talking about their relationships or you know, the stuff that they f felt was private, once they wanted to talk about what they did, what they felt about what their their, their roles were, uh, they would relax and like it even. They, they had a chance to say things they never got to say to anybody else because nobody else asked. Uh, 
but bottom line, to answer finally, laboriously, your question, uh, if I couldn't come up with something after an hour to uh, nourish a, the piece, then I said, screw it. And, and so there would be the occasional people that uh, I just, you know, they famous and not famous, and so I just didn't write it. Uh, I can't think of a really great example, but um, just one that Marg Helgenberger, who used to be on CSI oh, yeah. uh, years ago when she, when she was still on it, and, and pretty big deal. And I just, I was, you know, she, it wasn't like she was, I expected her to be a great intellect or anything, or in, anything, but we, I just couldn't get anywhere with her. Nothing, nothing resulted, and I, Toss that tape in the drawer, but so that that's my example of of uh, ditching a project, my my how I my standard. But no editor or writer really wants that to happen, you know. Like if you get an assignment from an editor, say you got an assignment from me, you're worried about that, you know. My. It, it, it is not the editor, it, I don't think it's any editor's first instinct when a writer discovers that the piece isn't turning out exactly like he or she thought. I don't think any edi editor's first move is to say, screw it, I'll pay you your kill fee, bye. <laughs> you know, if we went to the trouble of reading your pitch and deciding out of all the other pitches that we got that your story was doing worth doing, I'm much more inclined to help you figure out how to make it work and won't kill it until it just becomes apparent that it won't work, which I rarely, rarely, rarely have. And sometimes when you hit a wall in a story, that's a moment when you might have a really creative solution. You go around it. Yeah. Maybe the wall is there because that approach is not the right approach. Maybe the right approach is going to be your breakthrough that will make the story actually work. So don't be stubborn and bloody your head against an obstacle when that obstacle might be saying not that you're screwed up, the obstacle is saying something else. Wait a second, the path's over here. So just walk four feet away and the subject will open up to you. The, there's also, you're always getting more than you think, too. You're always, I once, when I worked at LA Magazine, because uh, it's in the celebrity cult, cultural capital, the celebrity, cult, capital of the celebrity uh, industrial complex, uh, Hollywood, uh, the way we dealt with it, we had, uh, a feature about a celebrity in the front of the magazine every month. It was called Encounter. And if you were on staff at the magazine as I was, you not only wrote the big features, but you had to write a number of these every year. And, you know, as a consequence, I met a lot of really fascinating people and uh, did some great ones. Uh, you know, 1,200 words on Ian McShane, 1,200 words on Elizabeth Banks. Uh, uh, but one of the people I got assigned to was Ji Zhang. Ji Zhang. She was the star of Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and a number of other uh, films. Chinese uh, did not speak a word of English, not a single word. Her translator was with me when I spent time with her. But it was just I got two or three fragmentary quotes, but. Please. Do you speak any Chinese? Yeah, I don't speak any <laughs> Chinese. Well, I was, um, but I still managed to craft together a, a suitable piece, maybe even a good piece, because <laughs> she had a history, she had a purpose, she had something she was working on. There were certain elements that were just there, and if I could build a little structure and do, I'm a big advocate of outlining. Outlining is the solution to, to most problems in a writer's life, to pull back. And it doesn't have to necessarily be a Roman numeral, uh, capital A, although I do kind of like the format of the old classic outline. But 
You can just put down a number of bullet points on a piece of paper and then see how they connect. You know, does A lead to B? Does B lead to C or does it lead to D? And, and if you have seven or eight points, that's a thousand word piece right there. Uh, and yeah, yeah it's, it's a, um, but it's, it's a way of establishing, a lot of the difficulty in writing is the fear factor and it's fear of the unknown, um, but it's also fear of not, think if you were gonna take a trip without a map, that would be what writing without an outline is like. If you give yourself a map, there's a chance you, you can get to where you're going and it, it helps transform chaos into order and writing is finally an exercise in ordering and uh, and construction. There's a there's a order to almost any piece of writing. There's a beginning, a middle, and an end to any real piece of writing. It can be unconventional, but there is some sort of order that you impose on your material, and then you can work with your material and as opposed to being overwhelmed by it. And what Steve's talking about is really good tool for one of the biggest challenges that I find younger, less experienced writers who try to do long form pieces for us is, you know, it's one thing to be able to hold the reader's attention through a 750,000 word feature in red and black. Uh, to care, to hold a narrative arc that in which the reader does not get lost over three to 5,000 words it's a hard thing to do. It's not easy. And it's that organizational factor, that understanding how to make a piece flow from point A to B to C, all in a common purpose, uh, is one of the biggest challenges that the underwriters we work with uh, face. And you just heard a great prescription for how to work through that. So, we're out of town, right? This has been phenomenal.